before we introduce the next conversation, which we're going to have with the CDD Ghana, uh, time as soon, time as soon. And Stroma, your friend, the latest reality show to hit Ghana and your screen soon on your number one TV channel, Adam TV, is on. And uh, basically, we're asking whether you're a talented singer, you're confident, whether you dream of becoming the next Samachi Dede, the next um, good singer like Daddy Lumba Sakodie, or any of the legends that we've experienced in our country. And you should be uh, between the ages of 8 to 12 years and also make sure that you meet the Adum TV team today, the 29th of August, 2018 at the Maclean Hotel Kumasi at 9 a.m. Sharp to audition your way to greatness. Again, don't forget, it's today, the 29th of August at Maclean Hotel Kumasi at 9 a.m. Sharp Melody Hotel, Takradi on the 4th of September and... Uh, in Accra at Irata Hotel on the 8th of September. I remember Irata Hotel is located at East Lagos. Remember, you're also uh, to be between the ages of 8 to 12. If you're a minor, please have the consent of, uh, of your parents as usual because we, we all know you all fall in that category. This is the time to shine. And it's from my train only on Adam TV. Well, it's also brought to you by Zwan. What a wonderful taste oba spaghetti the food you can trust and uh, kingdom garlic capsules it's also supported by homeopathic clinic and the mickling hotel well please make sure that you make a date with us we're going to bring you some good talents all on your screens but let's move on. We're hosting Dr. Kujo Asante, who is a senior research fellow at the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, on a number of governance issues, because it's been 20 years since the CDD Ghana was established, and uh, the 14th year, as they're going to have the Kronte Nyakwemu lectures, is coming off tomorrow at the Alisa Hotel, or what they call now the, the Swiss, the Swiss Spirit Hotel. Yeah, well, used to Alisa, aren't we? But also good for the directions as well. Just Google it and you get to have your way. Good morning to you and thanks for speaking to me good once morning, again. Good morning. It's always a delight. Yes. Uh, we get to speak about all relatively things, corruption, governance issues <laughs> in our country. And, um, well, Kukubako delivered the last uh, lecture. That's right. And I listened to him live on radio. Yes. But particularly the issues of corruption always kept coming up and um, how he... Uh, recall these experiences through the times, the revolution, right. and what we're experiencing now, the democratic dispensation. Mm -hmm. And rightfully, your theme for this year's Kuntinia uh, Kumu lectures is rightly on, on uh, 25 years of existence, etc., yeah. but also based on certain principles. That's right. So basically, uh, uh, Mr. Jima Boedi, who is our immediate <laughs> past yes. executive director, he retired uh, after 20 years being at the helm. Uh, will be delivering the lecture. And he is taking the Lincolnian uh, definition of democracy, uh, the simple one, government of the people, by the people, for the people, and trying to reflect over the 25 years of our constitutional dispensation uh, to assess, you know, how have we met these principles. And I think for me, the most important one at the end is democracy for the people. And that's the issue that you're raising about corruption, for instance that at the end, uh, the system of government that we put in place must be able to uh, generate some uh, material benefits. As a principle in itself, it's important, but it also has to be able to deliver some material benefit for the welfare of the people. And I think the constitution in the directive principle of state policy is very clear about that. So that's what uh, he aims to be able to talk about, uh, take a journey, uh, a walk through the 25 years and say, how far have we met these things? Uh, mm. So that's, that's, the, that's the theme for... And, and, and it's always good to have such themes because democracy and based on what Abraham Lincoln had espoused yeah. initially and, uh, and trying to have um, all those ideals which have now been embedded in democracy in America yeah. and translated across the world, is having people participate, yes. but more so those who govern, yeah. Uh, or the duty bearers, as civil society mm. likes calling it, uh, to be more responsible mm. to, to the, the people. people yes. At the end of the day, what sort of conversation CDD uh, has had over the period mm. that will tend to engender the sort of conversation um, as, and then as people listen to the lecture, it, it become more consolidated? We, we, I think 
what we can say and, and our personal contribution as an institution is f being focused on the building blocks of democracy mm. so routine elections making sure that the elections are freer and fairer and so on and i think that everybody can say in you know if you compare ghana to many african countries our elections generally have been more progressively free and fair uh, they still have we still have issues uh, as we are sort of new things like technology comes in the other challenges but on that process of just having routine elections and therefore you can guarantee stability of, of a political system we have done well but I think what we are missing and which really is a bigger challenge is how people govern when they are entrusted with public power and that has to do with making uh, duty bearers more accountable uh, making them more responsive but just be more prudent uh, with with the use of resources to be more innovative to be able to solve the problems that uh, we've experienced so there's no reason why we still are getting flooding in Accra over the whatever years you know where is innovation in terms of governing uh, why we are we still have this pervasive corruption so we are not solving our our problems the collective problems that we have which we let governments to basically do and those are the challenges that I think uh, many of us now want to pay more attention to so this is a good uh, I think uh, transition for us in terms of the topic and the discussion uh, we want to look at more how uh, more inclusive government we can get more inclusive development so that even when we get growth we it's not unequal to the point that you know uh, you, geographically you can see if you get outside of Accra it's a whole different Ghana <laughs> and if you're I, in the north and you're in the south it's a whole different Ghana so those kinds of conversations I think are important for the next 20 years for CDD yeah and and, and yesterday I was reading something on the net uh, I, I believe it was one of those uh, WhatsApp snipers of uh, whether encouragement or information about how those who could do the right things um, have the right sort of intellect, mm -hmm. knowledge, who could contribute to developing our democratic systems, mm -hmm. don't tend to be involved, mm -hmm. as we have seen in the Fourth Republic. Mm -hmm. And with their apathy could also mean that we're going to have um, those who don't have the right sort of knowledge and expertise yeah. doing the governance. Yeah. Uh, how do we enrich the narrative or the conversation in such a way that there's um, that sort of all-inclusive, not necessarily only with party to party, yeah, sure. but also the people yes, who have the knowledge yeah. to be participating, it, it's integral. A, it's a challenge, but it's almost like chicken and egg situation. So a lot of people will tune off radio or tune off TV um, because the, it's too noisy. The, they think, oh, maybe the substance is not there. People are not focusing on issues and so on. But Everything, you know, as they say, election has consequences. Uh, when you elect somebody and whatever decisions they take in terms of management of the economy as well, it can affect your, uh, your income, it can affect uh, your investments, it can affect your savings. So you, if you, you check out of the system, uh, it's just not possible. You are going to be impacted one mm. way or the other. And that's why I think it's an imperative for particularly the middle class and the group that you're talking about, people who have more education, uh, people who have more exposure, and these days with the internet and so on, um, have to be more involved uh, in the day-to-day -day governance of, of society. They need to be able to get their voice out there. They need to be able to demand for accountability and be interested uh, in governance generally. So um, it, it's, it's easier to check out. But the consequences, you can't check out and not feel the impact. Uh, if Accra, there's a flood in Accra, uh, you're not going to be safe. So I think that is a conversation that um, all of us are trying to have more with, with citizens generally. Um, I, I personally feel that at some point we have to say that if leaders are not leading us, then citizens should lead their leaders. Mm. You know, well, we need to take. Yeah. We need to take more interest. Mm. We need to drive the agenda more, well. so that we get what we want from our leaders. Yeah, and across Africa, the situation may be different. Yeah. It could be, let's say, uh, Bobby Wine yeah. in Uganda, That's who right. is now calling on 
the bulk of the larger population, yeah. young people yeah. under 35, yeah. etc., to be yeah. involved in their governance yeah. and all that. And then coming to us, uh, having a good democratic system, yeah. proper elections, few disagreements, yeah. but still not getting the satisfaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we look at that principle of state policy, uh, principle, directive principles of state policy, as stated in that chapter six mm -hmm. of our constitution, mm -hmm. how is um, all the notion, the concerns about corruption, perhaps an impediment or a hindrance in achieving what should be achieved? Yeah. I, for me, and it's my number one problem personally, and uh, that's why I have a whole agenda <laughs> around it, it's yeah, because I know you're leading the Ghana Anti Corruption yeah, Coalition. Yeah, the, and the Corruption Watch. is also involved yeah, the corruption uh, as Watch an ambassador. And all that. Because I think we've gotten a point where corruption is normalizing. It's it, becoming a it's, norm. Yeah, people are people see integrity as an exception. So being a person of integrity, you are you know you are sort of different because everybody does it, and even the idea that this is bad, wrong, is changing. This is the way things are done. So you kind of, you, 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 you put a label on it that is not negative. You know, you do it. Or if you're doing it, it's a blessing. All right. So we've got into a point where if we don't take care, we actually cross that rubric. Where well, we see nothing wrong with what, should, what is wrong. What is wrong. And rather, we see everything wrong with exactly. questions that are raised with what is wrong. That's right. So as soon as you start, I know. You think I, we're getting there? No, I think we are there. Or oh, we're there. We've all, already crossed the line. I think we are there. We are there. And, and it's how much of a pushback we begin to push, you know, to make sure that we don't completely go on the other side. But it's not possible that uh, civil society organizations like yourself have not or may not have done enough may not have raised the right questions on the duty bearers, and then also may not have uh, engendered the conversation or enjoined the citizens to be more proactive in, be, in, in, in taking part in the conversation, in the institutional dialogues and the ideologies. It's possible. I mean, we, I, for me, the, the fact that we have not become more, we've not, become people um, we are not become more people of integrity as compared to being more corrupt uh, over the years says that we have not done well we have I mean if you look all the statistics will tell you if you take uh, say the corruption perception index over mm -hmm. a period we've stagnated at around 3.5 uh, 3.5 uh, the score of 3.5 if you take an average over the last you mean 10 we keep years hovering around it's the same we have not moved so i mean if all of the efforts we've made and as you said we've gone through revolution time we've shot people we've whatever and it's still not making an impact then there's something fundamentally wrong about uh, our appreciation of ethics you see the point i make about if corruption becomes the underlining and acceptable then nobody's safe because basically Everybody is corruptible, including your security, your, you know, you cannot trust a service provider. You cannot trust anybody that they're giving you anything that's genuine. The food that you eat, you can't trust because somebody would, you know, put something in it and pay somebody off so that they can come and sell you on wholesome food. That is the extent to which corruption starts eats up. When you start thinking of countries like, you know, the narco states and it starts small, but it gets to a point where... It becomes uncontrollable. It can't control and it. And you, you feel that we've crossed the line, we're getting there. I think we are getting there. To the brim. Really. And, and, and it's, it's a mindset that if we don't begin to fight it and say that this you know, is not, it's not right and we need to push out. And one of the ways I think is, you know, uh, one of the ways in which we can do that is we need to start freeing our people from state-sponsored corruption. Meaning what? There are some types of services in this country that is only the state that provides. Like? A passport, a birth certificate. You want us to outsource it? No. That, the corruption that exists in that place. So if you, if you don't engage in that corruption, you can't get access to that service. And the state can do something about it. 
and this is really about everyday corruption. So if you, if you can free, uh, and majority of the people who engage in petty corruption is around these kinds of services, going to get an electricity pole, or getting electricity extended to your place, or a meter, or, a meter, or water meter, or whatever. Or you having a placement, uh, a pla stability results, and you having placement for your children. Those kinds of things, the state can deal with by you know declaring this place as you know uh, corruption free zones or whatever it is that you call it <laughs> so it's for me if we free people from there yeah. we would have started in a big way it's a uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting them. point yeah. that you raise yeah. but we shouldn't forget that we're, we're here because um cdd ghana is having the 14th edition of the Kruntenia Akwemu Lectures is going to take place at the, what used to be called the Alisa Hotel, but it's now the Swiss Spirit Hotel. Yeah. That's the time it, is right? 5 p.m. Yeah. Uh, 5 p.m. Yeah. And I'm sure it's going to be live syndicated. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. And so, um, but as you join the conversation, um, we know that things happen in communities that enjoins everybody. For example, we're supposed to have uh, an assembly member or mm. uh, the MC or the assembly itself that is supposed to take care of security and things don't work mm. in that mm. order. Mm. Now, in order um, for the lecture by Professor Jim Abwede to make meaning to the people, yeah. are we going to have examples of everyday things, mundane things that happen oh, that, yes. that we take for granted, yeah. but that seem to build up the the behavior patterns sure. uh, of corruption. No, I, I, I expect that. I mean, he, he, he tends to uh, always have examples. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a political scientist, but also very uh, a historian. He, he always is able to recollect and put things in perspective of how we have progressed over the years and give real examples of how that has happened. Um, I mean, I think one of the, the, the ways in which, you know, we, we need to start thinking of everyday things when you think about elections is basically the money that goes into elections because i think that's one of the sources of the problem if we don't do something about campaign financing you already have set the stage for corruption right from elections because you cannot tell where politicians get their sources of money nobody does a documentation of who, who donates to who. Uh, so people uh, recently, the 11 million or so dollars to buy purchase buses and so on for uh, MP, during like, the MPP Congress, for instance. It was 13 million. 13 million. I mean, well, when you, it's supposed to be a bank loan, we're uh, told. Yes, but the point is You don't is believe that, it, obviously. Well, the Not point, you, but as an institution. Yeah, but the point is that uh, the. And if an individual is going to uh, procure a loan, you have to have a certain basis. They will say, okay, what's your collateral? What? So, I mean, I don't think that the, the individual that is, is uh, able to raise this money has that kind of collateral to do that. But even if that is the case, spending that amount of money for a party primary to elect a chairman, that is ridiculous. Because what does that mean? It means that if you are investing that amount of money, who's going to pay for that? <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's, it's, if we don't deal with that money side of politics, then we are in a democratic accountability structure. We are already condemned that process to failure. Okay. So I take some few things from what you have said today. You're saying that uh, behavior patterns and uh, the characterization of our society is getting uh, more steep and corrupted mm -hmm. because of the actions. Be, be, because of the actions of those who tend to govern us. Yes. But the truth is, those who tend to govern us, the politicians or those who head government, yeah. if they want to stop the acts that yeah. go on, they yeah. can. Yeah. can well, they? I, I, I think, yeah. I mean, I think, as I said, for, for birth and death, for instance, if the government today says nobody should be collecting uh, bribes and we would, we would prosecute anybody, who, it would happen. Yeah. If you go to the hospital, and you, you, you know, you, it's very clear that if you do it, we'll prosecute you. It will happen. I think that really frees a lot of people from, as I said, <laughs> state-sponsored corruption and begin to promote more integrity. Then they can also have the moral authority to demand integrity from their 
beauty barriers. Well, we have to end the conversation, yeah. but before we go, though, yeah. um, I don't know whether you use a lot of uh, or you do analysis of social media and what the public comments are also on mainstream media, et cetera, on many issues. Yeah. Because uh, on, on a, a tiny subject like why we need to build a national cathedral, yes. uh, um, the, the, if you look at the sum of the, of the views out there, yeah. the public is not for it. Yeah. What's yeah. your view on the subject? Well, I mean, first of all, I, if you're saying it's a state that is building a national cathedral, I think it's a misplaced priority. If it's a state that is building... Well, the it. state is galvanizing. Sure. So for me, I think you can start from the premise and say that uh, the Christian community, you know, uh, in their contribution to Ghana and schools, hospitals, whatever, and so on, if they are interested in building a national cathedral, the state would definitely be in a position to say, oh, for all your contribution to our general welfare, we can donate a land. But then it's a question of, okay, what kind of land would you donate? And that's why the idea that you have to basically uh, destroy all of these structures that we have used money, recent money, to, to barely construct, to give that land, I, that I don't agree. I think there could be other land that could be available for this kind of, uh, uh, of edifice. So. It should be uh, the Christian community interested as the state, certainly, for all their contribution, you need to be able to say, yes, I would, I would support, I will contribute. You think this smacks of corruption? Well, I don't. I mean, one of the things we also, we are talking, we haven't seen any documentation as to what exactly is the relationship, who is paying for what, right? We haven't seen any documentation. Every, what everybody hears is what the state is saying or those that are involved are saying, what is the documentation, what is the legal documentation that the state will provide? This could be an MOU, or, so that we can all be abreast of what exactly the arrangement, the legal arrangement is. Well, thank you very much. You're and welcome. Dr. Kujua Sante is with the CDD. Remember, tomorrow, 5 p.m. at the Swiss Spirit Hotel, just uh, some few meters away from us, they're having the 14th edition of the Kruntinia Kwemu Lectures. And um, a former boss of CDD, Professor Jima Bwedi, is delivering this time around. We're looking at 25 years of um, the Fourth Republic, the great democratic dispensation. We're all proud about what we should be looking forward to, what we haven't done right, and uh, what the future holds for us. But